Hello, everybody. Welcome to the next iteration of our uh, Real ML reading group. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Emmanuel Bengio, who is right now a senior ML scientist at Recursion, uh, working on drug discovery and advancing uh, um, model and unraveling the science behind modern biology, which is uh, it's amazingly a very, very cool company. So I hope to hear more about it as well. And so Emmanuel got his PhD from uh, McGill and um, under the supervision of uh, Joe Pinot and doing a backup and worked on, uh, on various aspects of deep learning, generative modeling, reinforcement learning, and combining all these ideas in very awesome work. So I'm sure looking forward to hear something about it. Yeah. Off you go on my own. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, you know, my name is on, on this slide, but really this has been the work of so many people and this is a very outdated slide that I should update, but I didn't even know that there are BNF space. Um, there's now officially more different papers than I have time to read, <laughs> which is both good and bad. Uh, you know, people seem to be excited about it, and uh, that's really heartwarming in some sense. Um, so yeah, this is like lots of people's work. And it all started when we we're trying to do drug discovery. Um, and you know, as as you mentioned, I, I did my PhD mainly on reinforcement learning, and that's kind of the first thing we tried to tackle this problem. Um, and we were having trouble because drug discovery is pretty hard. Like the space is really big. Uh, a lot of the states are, are pretty bad. Um, and so it would be hard for our agents to kind of generalize properly and visit the kind of diversity of things that existed. Um, I'm assuming that people here have some reinforcement learning background, but just to be sure, like, and I'll talk about an episode in the context of like generating a molecule, right? Kind of start with the empty molecule and you build something block by block. Uh, and that, you know, trajectory is what I'll call an episode. Um, and it's a pretty important concept here in, in GFLNet that kind of generating things. Um, and so kind of always going forward and, and building constructively something never deleting uh, or, or kind of going backwards. Um, and so, you know, we, of course, try to playing RL first. Um, everything's there. There's an environment with actions, with a reward. There is some, some great RL work in drug discovery. It's very fast. Um, but as I, as I alluded to, what really is a, is a bottleneck here is that uh, it's a bit too greedy. Uh, even regularized R RL with maximum entropy and all that stuff. Um, in practice, kind of seems to find a couple of good modes, right, in the distribution and kind of stays stuck there. Um, and because we cared about, like, at the time at least, uh, because of the uncertainty and, and everything, we were trying to find, like, a really diverse set of candidates that we could test. Um, this wasn't great. Um, MCMC is kind of the other end of the spectrum where, uh, you know, if you let it run enough, if you, you recover the entire distribution and you have lots of diversity, uh, but also in practice, you know, you get stuck easily, um, especially in something like molecular design. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but like there's activity cliffs, which means that uh, the kind of mapping from state to reward is extremely discontinuous. Uh, and, and so, this makes methods like MCMC uh, much harder. And, and there's a few papers that try to apply it to drug discovery, but uh, it's, a, it's pretty challenging. We also have the usual generative models, right? There's data sets of molecules. So you can train a generative model like a GAN um, on, on molecules that you know work. But um, it kind of throws away the, the smoothness of the signal, right? Um, when you measure, for example, the binding energy of a molecule to a protein, right, it's not a yes or no. Uh, there's, there's some smoothness there where some molecules bind more or less than others. And so kind of relying on uh, just this data set of, of positives kind of throws away that information. And so here was our hypothesis. Uh, we want to do something like MCMC, right? Energy-based model where take sample proportional to some energy function. Um, because we're doing RL, we call it a reward. 
And uh, we wanted to do this, but without markup chains and more like reinforcement learning. And so um, I got this insight from SunTrees, which is data structure ironically using reinforcement learning, uh, which I later kind of figured out has some equivalence to control as inference. Um, so I'm gonna go through the story problem just to kind of concretize uh, the intuition here and let me know if you have questions at any time. All right, so um, you can think of this DAG as an MDP, right? The market decision process where an episode goes that you start at the initial state as zero and you sample actions forward. And what we'd like to achieve is this distribution on the right where you sample these terminal states, these boxes, uh, proportionally to their reward. Right, so here are a pretty easy pattern of one, two, three, four. And one way to do that, if like this DAG was to be your entire uh, thing and you wanted to represent it as a data structure is to take the sum tree approach because you know that the reward is positive here. Um, you can simply take the sum of the reward of every child of a graph, a uh, child of an error, right? So for the state, uh, the F, I'm gonna call it, is seven, uh, but this one it's nine because you get the two plus the seven for the root node is ten. And then one way to sample uh, these terminal state and to sample these trajectories is to follow the policy which says that you're going to sample a child with probability proportional to its sum divided by the total sum of the current state. Right, so the probability of this hop is nine over ten probability of this hop is seven over nine. And so you end up that the probability of ending is this state, in this state, for example, is four over 10. And everything kind of works out. Uh, so, you know, in is this simplified setting, we do get that the uh, probability of sampling some x is proportional to its reward. Um, problems start to happen if uh, the state space, the MDP is a DAG, right? If there's multiple ways of generating the same object and you apply the same kind of strategy of, of summing things backward, um, you end up kind of, um, uh, sorry, double counting things, right? So here in this example, there's two paths to this four. And so the word of two is double counted, right? You end up with a larger total sum and you end up uh, sampling S4, well, everything would be wrong for a but in particular S4 kind of twice as much as you should. And this is because um, if you think about it from an RL perspective, what you're doing is that you're uh, setting the probability of trajectories to be proportional to the reward, right? This, this is what kind of uh, control as inference does. Uh, algorithms like soft view learning, uh, soft actor critic, this is the solution that they find, right? Um, and this is different than what we like, which is to sample these terminal state probability with probability proportional to the reward. And this actually matters. You think, uh, you know, it's just kind of constant difference, but it's not actually. <laughs> and something like uh, the problem of generating molecular graphs, um, there's actually like an exponential number of, of different paths that lead to the same graph. Um, and in particular, like the worst graphs have more paths that lead to them, right? And so the overcounting gets really, really bad. And in some sense, like modern deep reinforcement learning is, is just heavily concerned with trajectories and, the, and so it doesn't directly solve this. Um, instead, the approach we take is that we'd like to have some kind of energy preservation so that the reward of terminal states is not overcounted. And the way we achieved that was by um, specifying that instead of being just like naive sums, we're gonna think about the, 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 the stuff that we're counting as flows, right? The flows of water, flows of particle that go through these edges. And our constraint is going to be that we want the inflow of a state, all the flow that goes into it, to be equal to its uh, outflow, right? So for example, here, the outflow of this node is two because it's a terminal kind of sync state. And the inflow is the sum of a flow that comes from these parent states. 
Um, and so, you know, for example, one valid solution here is to split this flow of two uh, into two equal parts, right? So you kind of send one unit of flow that way to S1 and one unit of flow that's, that way to S3. And if you do that, you recover the fact that you sample states, terminal states, with probability proportional to their reward, uh, which was our uh, desiderata. So I'm going to pause here just in case there are clarifications needed. Can I just uh, ask you to clarify the um, how this, the trajectory of, of states maps onto a, a graph here? Yeah, so you could imagine one transition here to be like add a node to the current graph or add an edge or you know, something like that. Some sort of edit, edit operation? Yeah, exactly. But it's important here that those edits are constructed, right? So kind of all the edits that add something move you from uh, left to right here. Uh, and, you know, kind of the reverse, the, the destructive edits would like move you backward in that graph. That kind of matters. Okay. And what, what would be the, the initial state here? Um, I mean, it's in some sense up to the problem, but for designing molecules, it's kind of just the empty molecule in some sense. So like you can start batting a carbon atom or a carbon ring or something like that. Got it. Maybe one more question. Why do you want to put mass on all terminal states? Uh, because it has nice properties, we think. <laughs> right? Um, I'll, I, I'll get to it a bit later, but in, uh, in cases where you're trying to approximate something like the binding energy, um, first of all, you're going to get limited amounts of data. And that data is going to be very noisy, right? If you look at modern docking software, like they don't even agree with each other. There's lots of noise, lots of stochasticity in the process. So if you even rerun the same thing twice, you get different results, right? Um, and so the, the, the targets you're going to get uh, are not going to be like the Oracle ground truth. And the point of, of having this objective is that we'd like to give probability mass kind of everywhere where it makes sense and not just in the argmax. And that's because, first of all, there's going to be some uncertainty with respect to R of X itself. Um, but also, you want to make different bets on different parts of the state space. And that's because the function approximator that's, let's say, estimating the binding energy here, that's giving you your reward, um, sometimes it's going to generalize well, right? And sometimes it's going to generalize poorly. So in some regions of that manifold, uh, you're going to find you know, good candidates. Um, but uh, they might be wrong because the model is generalizing poorly, whereas it's generalizing right in another mode of the manifold. So you want to capture all those nodes in some sense. That's yeah, yeah, that's it makes sense. Idea. Makes sense, but I'm a bit afraid that with these molecules and so on, they are very large rich spaces, as you say, and a lot of these candidates are terrible. A lot of them are just kind of okay, and very few are probably very, very good. So you will exhaust yeah. large budget on kind of the mediocre ones and the, the chances that you find a good one are decreased because you want to cover everything. Yeah, that, that's correct. That's why that's, that's what's why my question was kind of coming. Um, but, but yeah. yeah. So right. one thing that we do in practice is kind of use a temperature parameter here. Um, either, you know, we set a fixed temperature and that's kind of, adjust the greediness as a hyperparameter. The other thing we do is learn temperature conditional models that are able to both be greedy if you ask them to with a really low temperature or be very exploratory if you set the temperature to a very large value. I see. Um, and, and, and this does a bit solve the, the problem you're describing. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, oh, any other questions? Yeah, so one interesting thing about this kind of framework is that there's actually you know, multiple valid solutions. Um, and depending on the, the context, that can be like a good or a bad thing. And um, 
yeah, just like a, a slide on the relationship between how how can you think of applying MTPs uh, in the context of, of GFlowNet. Um, I don't know if it's that interesting for the suiting group, but the gist of it is, in general, if you have an MDP, you might not want to apply GFlowNet to it, but you can. Um, one way of doing so is by kind of augmenting the state description with the current time step. And so if time is moving forward, you're always going to recover a DAG, then you can apply uh, GFlowNet. Right, so one more visualization, just to make this maybe intuition a bit more concrete. Is there a question? Um, you know, again, here you kind of can think of the initial state as zero as, as being like the source of all uh, particles in each of the terminal states as sinks. And, and uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is given the reward function, right, the, the, the value that, that the sinks have, you want to find a valid flow. And finding that valid flow will give you a policy that lets you sample states uh, if you follow this policy, right, it lets you sample state with the right probability. So um, earlier I mentioned, you know, we want all the inflow to be equal to the outflow. This is what we call like the flow conditions. And this is basically saying, if you look at all the parents of state S prime and you add up their flow, it should be equal to either the reward of the state if the state is terminal, or the outflow of a state if the state is non-terminal. And if you're familiar with reinforcement learning, this should look very familiar. And that's because we can just turn this kind of equality into a temporal difference style equation where you minimize both sides. Um, and if you minimize this difference, you guarantee to actually converge to uh, the right, oh, to a valid flow, uh, as long as you're Trajectory distribution covers all possible trajectories with at least probability epsilon. Um, in practice, we don't actually do this because if you recall, the, 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 the flow of the initial state is going to be the sum of all possible rewards. And if your state space is 10 to the 20, that might be a bit too large. Um, so in practice, we kind of model everything in log space. And this has several advantages, uh, but in particular, it means that in terms of like magnitude of the loss and therefore kind of the capacity attributed to different states, uh, both early states and, and later states will have more or less the same importance, right? Because the difference of logs um, is gonna be more or less scale invariant in some sense, right? So if you have 10,000 10, minus 11,000, but the log of that, just as important as the log difference of 0 0.01 and 0 0.02. Um, and this, so this is a, the flow matching loss. And we also have this kind of epsilon to really say, well, the flow is actually really small. You don't need to care about it. Um, and you know, we used this objective in the first paper and it, it kind of just worked really well. Um, this was on a, again, a molecule task with uh, protein binding. And, you know, if you look at the, the reward of the top K candidates found, uh, it's, it's interesting, it's good. <laughs> but, you know, the other methods are not very far behind. And I'm sure that if we did a little more tuning, they'd probably be uh, on par with each other. I think the real interesting difference is this graph on the left, which is the number of different, um, modes that are found by the model, right? And so what do we mean by modes in, in the molecular context? Context, We just compute the Tanimoto distance between every new molecule sampled and molecule sampled previously. And if it's large enough and, and the reward is, is good enough, uh, we kind of declare, oh, we found a new mode, right? And we, every time that happens, we just count. Right? And, and you can see there's as training progress, a typical GFlowNet kind of just keeps discovering new parts of the state space. Uh, this is very much in contrast with RL methods, right? So here we took PPO as an example where, you know, if you look early on, like PPO is really good, it just kind of 
tries and, and then find lots of high reward stuff. But uh, it basically plateaus a lot and, and very fast. Uh, Mars here is an MCMC method that you know also works, but probably suffers a lot from mode mixing and, and very long mixing times. Um, and also struggles in that sense to find very diverse candidates. Um, since then, we've actually found like better, more stable objectives. Um, earlier, what we were modeling was the flows directly or the log flows. What we can do instead is uh, model the policy uh, jointly with the partition function Z. Um, one extra bit that we need, that we're going to need though, is what we call the backward policy. Right? So um, in a particular state, you can think of the forward policy as the usual, usual policy in reinforcement learning, which tells you kind of which state to go to next. In contrast, the backward policy, when we think about it, is that it tells you with what proportion to allocate flows backward for every possible parent of the, of the current state. And interestingly, we found that uh, this can be used to control the entropy, uh, and in particular, the entropy over the trajectories. Right? So if you kind of, well, you, you can learn this, but you can also set it manually, right? And if you set it to be the uniform policy, what actually happens is that this induces in PF, the forward policy, uh, it induces a policy that uh, has the maximum entropy on trajectories. Um, and uh, yeah, we found that you know you, you can do trade-offs between the two. Um, and uh, more recently, we found an even better objective that is more stable, where you know this is kind of a training objective over an entire trajectory. Um, but we, what you can do instead is apply the same logic, but over sub-trajectories. Um, so if you start you know in one state, uh, the the starting flow of that state multiplied by the probability of, of moving forward along that trajectory should be equal to the ending flow and then the probability of going backward from that state. Uh, just like we did for trajectory balance, you can turn this into an objective, which we call subtrajectory balance. And a neat trick, trick that, that we found is that, particularly if you have a trajectory of t time steps, um, you can use that uh, trajectory and kind of divide it into T squared sub trajectories, right? So we take the, sub, the one step sub trajectory from starting from zero, then a two step, three step, et cetera. And then you can do the same, right? So start at step one, one step, step, two step. Um, and, and this gives you more stable gradients. Uh, if you're familiar with something like TD lambda, uh, there's, there's some kind of connection here, kind of averaging over different uh, temporal estimates. And that helps uh, learning be more stable. Um, in the previous slide I've showed you, uh, actually, this was not an innocuous choice, right? Splitting the flow into two is exactly setting PB to be the uniform policy, right? PB the backward policy. And, and this really kind of makes it so that the, the probability of, of visiting the parent states of S4 is kind of spread around as most as possible. Um, so like this is a one slide summary of GIFONET. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you were unsure what's going on, uh, if you have a reward function and a DAG, RL will kind of give you its max and do that really well. Whereas GIFONET will find all its votes uh, because it is by design trying to spread around the probability distribution and, and induce diversity in what you're going to sample. And we think that this diversity is really good you know, for the reasons I mentioned before about you know approximation and, and one diversity because you're unsure of what your proxy, what your oracle prediction is actually telling you. Um, but more fundamentally, I think that unlike uh, you know state of the art RL methods, maybe um, inducing the distribution uh, where the data you sample is proportional to its reward is actually inducing the right distribution to train a neural network, right? I think that this, this kind of, of, of data distribution really takes advantage of uh, the potential, let's say, of generalization that neural networks have. 
So for example, here, the, the cartoon picture you should have in your mind is that, you know, even if the model only samples blue data, it should want to generate red data if, if the structural pattern kind of induces that. Um, there's a bunch of really cool different facts. And in fact, uh, this slide is out of date. In particular, recently, there's been papers at Mila, but also elsewhere, kind of showing equivalence between some, some objectives in GFLONET and something like variational inference. Um, there's also, of course, links with RL, where uh, when you train a GFLONET, what you're essentially doing is finding the policy that uh, maximizes the entropy, but not on the trajectories, rather on the terminal states. Um, so it's a different kind of max and parallel. Um, you know, on this slide, what I'm showing is like, GFLONET is an off policy method, which means you can use any kind of data distribution you want. It doesn't have to be uh, on policy. You can use kind of any behavior policy as long as it covers the space, uh, state space appropriately. Um, and one really neat thing that I think matters to this group <laughs> is that we found it to be really easy to fold in uh, kind of Bayesian optimization style things, right? So um, if you have uh, some kind of expected improvement estimate or upper confidence bound estimate, you can use that as your reward uh, when acquiring new data points. Um, this is just a small parenthesis, but um, the, yeah, you know, I, I've been recently more interested in applying these things, but also keeping up with like making cool fundamental research. And so what we've done in the last year was really to focus on multi-objective optimization. Um, and in particular, as I mentioned earlier, like you can train uh, GFLONETs that are reward uh, temperature conditional, right? So we see, uh, here we, kind of uh, condition a model on the inverse temperature parameter, and that allows it to trade off between exploring and exploiting. And uh, we also successfully trained conditional models that are conditioned on some kind of uh, preference, right? So if you have multiple objective, one simple way of combining them is in the linear scalarization where you have this omega parameter, uh, which is a vector that sums to one. And then if you train a model to be able to kind of sample for any kind of preference, uh, this implicitly induces uh, a Pareto front. Um, and we've, of course, applied that to different domains, including biological sequence design and, and molecule generation. Um, and like, this is the kind of, of results you get where uh, the model really discovers, not like it discovers the whole distribution, but also can sample from the Pareto front, which is what I'm showing you right here. Uh, in particular, for one of the experiments in the paper that I'm showing here, this was again like uh, molecular design where we're optimizing for binding energy, QED, synthetic accessibility, and also kind of uh, molecular weight where we're making sure the molecule is not too big. Um, oh, this is Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Um, just for FYI, for my background is in just like a material science and chemistry and everything. I've dabbled in some biology stuff. And so for me, like I'm a little less familiar with the, the networks you have here, but they look super exciting. Um, can you help me connect the dots a little bit more between what goes in and out of GFlowNet and how you connect that to like designing a drug molecule or something like that? You know, so like- Yeah, okay, let me, let me go back to, this diagram, right? Yeah. Um, you can see this as a uh, diagram representing one episode, right? So what you're gonna ask of your model is give me a molecule. And yeah. the model to do that starts the initial state and takes actions where it progressively builds a molecule. And when it's, mm -hmm. it's done, it says, okay, I'm done. And then it enters the terminal states where it receives a reward for having produced a given molecule. Okay, so are these molecules uh, enumerated beforehand? It's like, do, do you have to define the graph or? So you have access, I mean, depending on how you define 
the the sets of actions that the model can take, mm -hmm. you can potentially have access to the entire chemical space, right? Got it. Uh, another avenue that we've been using uh, as a test bed is to limit the model to use different fragments. Okay. Right? So it's its set of action is restricted in the sense that uh, it can only plug fragments of molecules together like Lego blocks. Uh, got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Maybe and, a follow up. Yeah. So do you? So how do you train this? Do you actually interact with like a as a, as a auto in an auto way where you interact with some kind of simulator, or do you yeah. have some kind of data of that you gathered? So you can do both actually, and and it helps. So you can do exactly like RL, right? You start at the beginning, you query the model for a probability distribution over its actions, and you sample. And so if it says, well, add this ring, you add the ring, and then you do that iteratively by sampling the model iteratively. But you always have the, the reward function? So the reward function generally is, is another model, right? So what we've done in, in the paper I was showing, the first paper on GFLONET, is we just you know uh, took a data set of molecules, ran it through docking, and from the docking results, uh, trained a neural network. Now this, this neural network, which we call the proxy, you can query it for whatever molecule you want. Yeah, yeah, query. So essentially kind of the training of a GFLOW that starts with a model that represents the reward function already. You don't build it up on flight. Usually no. Usually no. Um, so let me, usually it, the, 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 the the big picture looks like this, right? You start with the data set, like I was saying, you have maybe a bunch of molecules and you dock them. And with this, this data set, you train this model that predicts your reward. And then you train your generative model where you generate a candidate, the reward model uh, receives feedback. Uh, sorry, the, the generative model, the GFLONET receives feed, feedback from the reward model. And then you train and you do that in a loop. And when you kind of, satisfied in some sense, you take the best ones or you sample new candidates from the generative model, and then you query whatever Oracle you have. So in our case, that would have been ducking, right? Um, and then you kind of repeat the process. You either retrain your reward predictor from scratch or you fine tune it with your new data. And then you do another round of, of uh, training the GFLONET. But you don't address, for example, how to choose the candidate so that you improve the uh, improve the reward predictor later on. Yeah. So there's there's an interesting question of how do you choose those candidates that you send to the oracle. Uh, one thing that works well is kind of the standard Bayesian optimization thing, which is trying to predict either expected movement or UCB, uh, and, and taking those candidates that are you know potentially mostly rewarding or that you want to acquire information about and send those to uh, the Oracle. Mm -hmm. I see. Oh, good, 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 thank you. Oh yeah, makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Actually, yeah. Yeah, because kind of uh, when you mentioned this connection to RL, right, you usually RL, it also try to learn the reward function, right? Kind of in combination to deploying this generative problem. So that's why I was a bit mm. confused, but I don't know how I get. I mean, you could do both. Like you could query the Oracle kind of at every step, uh, but that might be extremely expensive. So in practice, like you do want to use these, these proxy models because otherwise training the the generator is going to be really expensive. I know, but also the improving the proxy, for example, could be extremely costly, especially in this kind of docking, right? Like you can't have a perfect yeah. proxy, but you could improve yeah. it by, okay, this is a very important information that I should add to the data set, which I haven't yeah. initially. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. You, sorry, I like, yeah. let, let you talk. <laughs> I mean, I, I, can, I can wrap it up. Like, I think, you know, you, 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 he asked the question of what data do you use? And I said, oh, you can sample the model. But um, again, from an RL perspective, this is an off-policy method. So you don't have to sample the model. What you can do is 
kind of if you have a molecule already you you can generate a trajectory by just going backward from that molecule and then you can train on that trajectory so if you have a data set of, of good molecules or, or interesting molecules you can actually use that in conjunction to sampling from your model to train the g4net and that tends to in some cases work much better because again if your state space is huge uh, initially the model is going to output nonsense and so by using this data set of, of interesting candidates you can guide it towards at least initially a uh, good data distribution um, can i ask a question when your oracle yeah. is a neural network or really any differentiable model right you not only get the prediction or the reward but you also will get a gradient uh, from the input um, and there are like bayesian optimizations that will use that gradient but in this framework you're ignoring it completely do you see that as somewhat of a limitation that like could be expanded upon later or do you think there is like something beneficial to ignoring the gradient of a model like the oracle um that actually allows you to learn these modes yeah. in a more diverse test well okay there's there's two things there um in well first in the discrete setting you don't really have a gradient right because the there's there's no gradient for like this atom being there or not, right? Um, but that's kind of a lie, <laughs> because there are recent papers that actually do, uh, like there's backdrop to the void, I think, and there's a bunch of other ones, um, that actually do this gradient estimation even through discrete actions. Uh, I guess we could use that. I've never thought deeply about it, but from what I understand in practice, uh, those are not ideal. Um, that's in the discrete case. In the continuous case, that is something you can do. And it's actually something that people do in reinforcement learning, uh, where if you have like the deterministic uh, actor critic set up, um, this is essentially what you're doing, right? The, the agent is taking a continuous action and then the the critic the critic's evaluation of that action is being backpropagated towards the policy and so the action is indeed adjusted towards that um, and you could have that setup where the critic is the oracle right or, or the proxy for the oracle that's another neural network that you can differentiate um, that's totally fair so far we've only kind of used GPL nets for discrete optimization although that's a lie because <laughs> Just like I think a few days ago on archive, um, a continuous GPLint paper popped up that's really interesting, but uh, did not have time to read it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I mean, we can we can go to the discussion phase like. Most of the rest of the talk is me saying, look at all these things we can do with GPLNets. Um, these are things being actively done at Mila that I know of, and sometimes I hear of papers after the fact that I wasn't even aware of. Um, people are trying to do you know, really fancy things with general design, molecular design, that's what I'm more aware of, but also like trying to use GPLNet to generate like parse trees and, and grammars. Um, trying to do like active learning with GFL nets is what I mentioned before. Um, Joshua these days is extremely interested in using GFL nets to kind of achieve, you know, system two kind of thinking where the GFL nets would be used to sample kind of hypotheses um, in a causal way, right? So you have an image and let's say the GFL net could, could decide to sample that uh, a graph depicting not depicting, uh, uh, linking different components of the image to kind of more symbolic, uh, symbolic discrete things. And that could be used as a representation that's uh, much more likely to generalize well in a system two way. Um, um, and yeah, so there's there's a huge frontier of work, <laughs> lots of new things to do with GFLNet. Um, you know, recently, relatively recently, we came up with the sub-TB objective. Uh, I'm sure we can do better. 
there's papers already suggesting that if you kind of bias the backward policy towards nice, interesting substructures, for example, that improves learning speed. Um, so there's definitely better ways to train them. Uh, there's definitely better ways to scale to both like very large objects with long trajectories, but also more objectives. Um, so far, you know, we've been using kind of the usual graph neural networks for graph transformers for sequences, but these might not be ideal. Maybe we need like specialized architectures for flow prediction. Um, you know, I, I told you I had a slide about if you see the three modes, the generalized, the four modes. That's a hypothesis. Like uh, as far as I know, it hasn't been tested very well, and so I think it would be neat to to kind of continue to work there and, and figure out whether GFONets really generalize well like we think they do. And of course, um, there's lots of links between GFONet and RL, and so I think there's lots of opportunities here to um, make uh, nice, interesting links and then improve RL even more. Um, yeah, so that was more or less it for me. I can expand on lots of things. Just let me know kind of what you're curious about. Uh, Kevin is your hand. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I'm pretty excited about this stuff. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, one is so whatever I, I'm trying to like design, like uh, active learning loops, everything. Uh, it, I always find that there's a lot of overhead involved in it because I have to build a model with calculate uncertainties, build infrastructure until I actually have the decision making and everything. And so it takes a while, right? And so part of me always wonders like, if I just threw that whole entire system away and just went to the lab and did my experiments, like, could I have gotten it done faster? You know, <laughs> have I been wasting time <laughs> in this overhead? Yeah. And so to that end, uh, could you give me your intuition about like how difficult or finicky these programs are to make a payment like that? Like how much overhead should I expect with this compared to the ones? Right. I know that's a really vague question, but I'm just looking for your intuition. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's multiple sources of overhead. Um, there's just in terms of like code, there's starting to be some really good code bases, code bases for GFONet. Um, and in that sense, like just importing them, specifying your environment and your problem, you know, that's that's some work, but at least like the algorithms have been tested and all. Um, you know, compared to maybe something like reinforcement learning. Uh, there's just less experience as a field, right? So we have a vague sense of what hyperparameters we should be using and all of that. But of course, there's not like a definitive guide to, to training your GFLNet out just yet. Um, at the same time, uh, just like in my experience, GFLNets have been more stable to train than reinforcement learning agents. And so that's kind of nice from my point of view, and it might save us some, some trouble. Uh, and so it, from that point of view, it might be easier to try than like reinforcement learning. Um, okay. I think that's yeah, I, I don't know if that's, oh. that was a, <laughs> maybe you want to try it or not. <laughs> I'll let other guys question. Maybe uh, can I ask a quick one? Um, so we, we've talked a lot about um, reinforcement learning, how you can view this as sort of, you know, a gen generalizing reinforcement learning in some ways. But I think the, you know, other big category, maybe you can view this, right, is reinforcement learning like methods for generative modeling, given that one of the, you know, goals is to draw samples from this yeah. high dimensional and potentially structured distribution. So I'm just wondering if, if you have any thoughts about how this method connects to some, maybe some of the generative modeling methods, you know, maybe autoregressive modeling or even some of the you know, other ones that yeah. have been popular lately? Um, definitely. Uh, oh, I don't have this slide. Sorry. Um, definitely, like, I don't know if I have the right version for this, but um, anyways, um, here is, I think I would see GFlowNets as actually a specialization of reinforcement learning in some sense, because you know we impose this special DAG structure on an MDP. If your MDP doesn't have that, then it's not immediately suitable to GFlowNet. But these extra assumptions really allow us to 
get better training objectives, right? That's that's what we observe in practice. If if you have the right assumptions, you can do the right things, and it, it's much faster to, to train with that. Um, in terms of other generative models, um, there's a very close connection to uh, variational methods. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, with that at all, but um, the trajectory balance objective, if I recall correctly, um, corresponds, though this looks a bit like a KL, right? And so this actually corresponds to uh, minimizing like the reverse KL between the forward policy and the backward policy. Um, and then the variations on that aren't exactly equivalent, but very similar. Um, and there, there's, I think, two papers out, either on archive or like KMLR, uh, Anyways, open review somewhere where uh, people kind of justify this parallel and then say, well, we can use the control variates of, of variational inference to stabilize learning. Um, another obvious link is like with uh, diffusion models and autoregressive models, right? Um, for the diffusion model, you can think in some sense of going backwards as adding noise and going forward as denoising. That's totally valid. You will end up with different learning objectives though. And um, I think there's been some like theoretical analysis in, in a recent paper also of like exactly what that equivalence is and when it's equivalent. And in terms of autoregressive model, I think the biggest difference is that uh, autoregressive models typically are trained with maximum likelihood, right? So you have a fixed data set and you kind of just match the data set, make it likely, and you hope that this generalizes. Uh, and it works super well in practice when you have tons of data. Um, in contrast here, you don't need to rely on a data set necessarily. And you can kind of, I think, really leverage the extrapolation that training your reward proxy in particular on this data set leverages, right? So. Uh, by by generating and querying a neural network, you can explore more of the state space than just what you would do when doing maximum likelihood. Um, any other connections? I think that's that's more or less it. I know what the question's that, that, about. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for for the info. We also usually do, we usually also stop the recording at some point and so that people can ask also a more, uh, uh, a more, um, let's say, questions that they don't want to stay public. So um, I think it's perhaps a good time now, maybe we encourage more questions. So I'll stop the recording now.